welcome to AFP. My name is Devane Desai and I'm joined as always by Mr. Sean K. On today's show, we discuss Montreal's comeback at BMO Field, what's next for TFC, what's next for the Whitecaps, the US Open Cup Final, Jonathan David's brace, and the rest of the Canadians abroad. Plus, we chat Valor's rise up the standings with Mitchell Tierney. We talk about everything CPO with Mitch. It's a great chat. Plus, we open up the mailbag. Another edition of Ask AFP. Sean, how you doing? Mr. Goss is getting married or has gotten married. B- major congratulations to him. But it's you and I, sir, uh, driving the ship today. How are you doing? Doing good. You know what I'm extremely excited for? Tomorrow's the day my panini box of World Cup stickers oh arrives. Oh, my God. Are you are you a panini guy? Are you, are you like I know that cards haven't been your thing, but panini stickers is like a special thing around World Cup. It's true. No, yeah. Uh, I, I've been getting messages from my old FIFA colleagues asking if I'm in for the panini as well, and I think through peer pressure alone, I will get in. Also, with the fact that Canada is being involved, it's an extra impetus. But in the past, not really, to be honest, Sean. Not much of a a collector. Oh. I'm curious though, like for these. You got to catch them all, right? Is the idea that you want to get every player of every team? That is traditionally the idea. Um, I think as I've gotten older and as the prices have gone up, it's got and and the amount of players have gone up and the teams and all that kind of stuff. the The set's pretty large this year, so it's going to be tough to catch them all. Like I'm, I'm getting a box of fifty packs. And I, I wouldn't be close to getting the set in, in right, that one box. Right. And that box is tossing me 100 bucks. So it's going to be tough, but the goal is to get Canada. That is the goal for me. I need to get doubles in Canada. I need to have one for yeah. the personal collection, one for the book to stick in. Uh, because I still do stick. I know that they're collector's items, but I will stick them on the book. Wow. <laughs> now, if you were a member of our, our Discord, you would know that SK is into... The actual card scene as well, oh. um, and you've got some beauties. Are you? Is there like? Because I, I'm vaguely aware of what happened with Pokemon recently, with the the recent jump up and how everyone was trying to get their cards appraised, etc. But is it the same kind of process for these cards as well? Oh yeah, yeah. You, you there's there's like months and months of backlog of trying to get your your cards graded and appraised um i just got a uh vinicius junior rookie card uh back <sighs> graded um so we're we're starting we're starting slow but uh, cool. i'm i'm excited but yeah it's one of those things that i love talking about in the discord nobody else really does but a lot of a few <laughs> a few a few of them a few of our our, our fans do uh Indulge yeah. from time to time. So, uh, but if you love soccer cards, man, come at me at Sean K on Twitter. <laughs> I, uh, you, you called me a non card guy. And I think that's fair to say, but I was visiting my parents this weekend and I went oh, into yeah. my old room and went through. So I used to like arrange my hockey cards and baseball cards by team and like was yeah, super yeah. into it. And I was trying to fill out like entire rosters. So I, I totally get it. And I don't know. I, I think like once you start, you can't stop. So I'm worried once I get in. It'll be an unlimited dive. No, I, that's completely it. Uh, like, if you asked me a year ago about soccer cars, I'm like, no, I'm not getting into that. I can't get into that. <laughs> yeah. Just, and then yeah. now it's like, I've basically regressed into being uh, a child again. I love pro wrestling. I love soccer cards. And I love Dungeons and Dragons. I am my own hero. <laughs> can you give me? Can you give me 15 to 20 seconds on CM Punk and the controversy? Oh man, he went wild this weekend and it's not fake. I think this is fully real and I think that the wow. company's in trouble. Uh for anyone who watches wrestling, hit me up on the Discord. <laughs> it's, it was I'm gonna hit most, you off. I'm gonna hit you yeah, off as well. Yeah, it was the most monumental uh post match press conference you'll ever see in any sport. The 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 leader of the the team uh just basically aired all his grievances to everyone on YouTube, wow. on TV. It was fun. So, uh, yeah, hit, hit us up in Discord. Speaking of Discord, let's talk Patreon. Perfect advertisement for patreon.com forward slash a football podcast. Before we get into today's show, we want to shout out our newest Patreon member. Welcome to the family, Jamie Nugebauer. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, big, I think I've you got seen it. Jamie on, tw- I think I got it. Jamie's on Twitter as well. Big, uh, Footy fan, TFC fan, great to have him in our crew, Sean. Uh, Jamie got a couple of sweet goodies by joining. 
Yeah, obviously, uh, joining Patreon, you get ad, uh, ad-free episodes. You're going to get this a day early, so Jamie, enjoy getting this. Uh, you also get an intro uh, only Patreon members get. It's a couple minutes of us just sort of dishing about the episode. Uh, and last but not least, uh, as we've been talking for the last seven minutes, uh, the uh, the Discord is available to all Patreon members where we get to chat all things. And uh, if you've got any secret loves or hobbies or anything that might not even be soccer, we're there to talk to you about it. So uh, it's it's a fun time. And Jamie, thanks so much for joining up. Uh, I know I've been uh, following him on Twitter for quite a while. I think we've chatted a bit about when my time at the Canadian Hockey League. Uh, definitely talked TFC. I think he's out in Saskatchewan right now. So we'll talk some CPL uh, expansion a little bit later with uh, with Mitchell. So that'll be fun. Big shout to Jamie. If you want to be like him and support us and chat with us about MLS, national team, CPL, and everything else, head on over to patreon.com forward slash a football podcast and support us today. When we come back after the break, Montreal, Toronto, the Canadian Classique, boy oh boy. Two teams going in opposite directions, plus what does the future hold for the Whitecaps? All of that coming up after the break. when this comes in in field Alan Chapman will blow his whistle it is a statement victory for Montreal in the Canadian Classic four goals to three they win here to deliver a hammer blow to Toronto FC's playoff hopes Luke Wildman said it well full disclosure welcome back to FP full disclosure Sean but I missed the start of this game and oh, no. I was told I was told <laughs> That it was 2-0 and everything is roses and the Italians have done it again and we can look forward to the last few games of the season. But I replied to this person who sent me that message, Sean, how many games have you watched this season involving <laughs> Toronto FC? Because the confidence you're displaying in us defensively was unfounded. And of course, it was Montreal, a statement, 4-3 win coming back from 2-0 down. It had everything that you've kind of seen from TFC this season, Sean, especially after the arrivals of Bernardeschi and Insigne. They're great. They have been great, but it has not been enough. And I think that was confirmed on on, sat, on Sunday, sorry. Yeah, it, 100%. And I think the other thing that was confirmed, uh, and once again, I think has been conf- talked about the entire season, but CF Montreal are what a team title contenders they yeah they showed so much confidence in their own ability to not get rattled by going two nil down seven minutes in to just punching them back within within 15 minutes like they were back two two with without a bat of the eye they knew what they were doing uh the celebration from kamal miller well well obviously uh me having my my tfc history it still was like it was sort of I don't want to say nice to see because I never want to say see Montreal scoring, but it was just like, no, he, he, (laughs) he had his moment. It was, it was great. It was a big night for him, I think. Uh, And obviously uh, post-match he, uh, he aired out some grievances as well. This is the quote. It's a fire quote, quote, we felt pretty disrespected going into this game. All of the questions from the media were asking, how are we going to cope with TFC when they should have been asking, how is TFC going to cope with us? fire from Kamal Miller and also 100% right because there was no real answer from TFC after those first two goals and after Montreal responded I think you saw the team wilt a bit but I I wanted to go back to what you were saying Sean because this is also a club that doesn't really do that well in Toronto I think they've got some demons of their own um, that we've talked about in terms of being fans of TFC being like yeah they're coming to to BMO tough place to play for them let's see how much they've really grown but I think if anything they could they've just shown how damn solid Wilf Nazi's outfit is. Uh, coming back that quickly, but also the people that were involved in the comeback, Georgi Mihailovic involved with that transfer to the Netherlands, but sticking around for the whole year. His buying obviously is not in question at all. Even if you wanted to maybe throw it out there as a talking point, it's simply not based on how he played in that game and how good of a player he has been. Um, Kowal Miller celebrating in front of his family, also a huge factor. Alistair Johnston looking like a number nine with that goal <laughs> he scored with his head. All of this combining, Sean, for a club record of points for Montreal and quite a few games left in the season, 52 points. I mean, that graphic showed on the broadcast and I was taken aback, to be honest. And I know they have a long history outside of MLS, but it feels right that this team is making club history, if that makes sense, Sean. 
Of, of course. They, like it, it, David said this, I think, a couple shows ago, but said that like you looked at their team last year and you said they're they're a good team, and and then they continued to add on top of it, and add on top of it. And while the team isn't full of superstars like your uh, Insigne and Bernadeschi, they are full of of like quote unquote homegrown superstars like Jordy Mihailovic, Kamal Miller, uh, Alistair Johnson. They they are they are a team that knows who they are and knows that they can beat any team on every single day. And it's it's interesting. And I don't know if if we've talked about this at all, but it, it sort of does have this Canadian men's national team feeling around it. Like mm-hmm. that there's this just air of confidence that they know what they're doing. And I just wonder if if Kamal and Alistair and 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 others and Sam are are bringing that sort of air of uh, I would not arrogance but quiet confidence that we can go into any single game and out punch anyone and and it's showing it's 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 so impressive it's uh, it's great to see um, for a club that had been sort of been making all the wrong moves in the last three or four years to sort of really start to change and then even today I I saw that. Um, that CF Montreal is moving back to um, general admission in, in the supporters section. So winning over the supporters back that way. So I think once again, the things are going absolutely right at CF Montreal right now. And uh, a championship run would be, would be very, very good for uh, Mm -hmm. soccer in Quebec and soccer in Canada. I mean, we mentioned this a few months ago, like if they win, will they come or will, what will winning mean for this franchise in terms of glossing over some of the mistakes you mentioned? And I think it's not just winning, but I think it's the way they've done it and how they've built the club, as you mentioned, Sean, and it's extremely positive. I, I was just looking at the roster and the veterans that they've added and it, they've been really perfect ads. If you like, I mean, I don't know if you could have expected R- Romel Kyoto to have this good of a season, <laughs> but I think it was yeah. a safe bet. It was a fair bet that you would get at least MLS production. And I think Kai Kamara has given them that, if not more so. And then perhaps we'll get to TFC all at the back of this comment, Sean, but like the midfield was an absolute disaster in terms of the competitive balance. Like Montreal ran the show in the midfield. And I think that's why even with the 2-0 deficit, they looked comfortable, if that makes sense. And I think that makes sense if you have a Wanyama or a Sam Piet in the middle of the park. And I, I think if we look at TFC, Michael Bradley did not have that support with him. And that's kind of been the issue we've seen the last few games. If we want to move over it to TFC. Yeah. Actually, before we do that, before we do okay. that, Ismail Kone, rumored to be going to Sheffield on deadline day. It seemed like it got... Not cancel, but there's too much paperwork to complete. But it sounds like Sheffield wants to revisit this in January at the very least. It's only a matter of time, eh? Yeah. And and honestly, it's probably a big win for, for Montreal in the sense that the paperwork didn't get done in time. It bring, keeps... Like, I'm not sure if Sheffield was looking to, to basically have him come in right away, but money surrounding him, it sounds like they probably would. So I don't know if he would have been a part of that squad moving forward. So having Kone stick around, also if Kone can continue to play the way he's been playing, there's going to be more competition come January. Uh, if he gets a World Cup call, not that I'm saying he's going to, but like there, I think this is the right situation for Montreal because I think that that dollar amount could go up a little bit. I'm not saying he's going to get $10 million, but but once again, three or four more months of potential big moments for him. Uh, it'll be interesting. Um, but yeah, going back to Toronto, um, that that midfield, it's it's been a problem all season. And it continues to be one because this midfield can't stay healthy. And when the, the depth is asked for, there isn't really support. Uh, whether it be Jaden Nelson or or even Insigne, who who sort of came back into it, it just you you basically left Michael Bradley to fend for himself, and he's he can't fend for himself, especially against a midfield of that quality. Um, do you do you feel like Toronto moving forward with an Osorio K and Bradley core in the midfield is the right move, or do you think that there's a need for? Uh, addition of of a starter in that in that three. Yeah. Well, I, I my concern is that I I don't like Mark Anthony K hasn't been that healthy since he's been with TFC uh, and he looked pretty rusty, but I think that's understandable. And Oso yeah. is still out with the the concussion and the head injury stuff. I, my issue is I don't I don't know if you can bank on them playing enough games to 
to make the investment worthwhile when it comes to maybe giving Oso a new contract. Because I think we saw Michael Bradley at his best surrounded by the likes of those guys in the midfield. And that's when the Italians had first come over and you saw Michael kind of revert back to to the glory days, to be fair. But I think when you're surrounding him with kids who are perhaps not at the level that he should be, it's too much. And I, I don't think that's a revelation at this point in the season, Sean. You know no. what I mean? Like, I guess in April or May, when we saw the lineups that Bob was trotting out, it was understandable to expect these growing pains and to see some unbalanced play. But at this stage, I also look a bit at the kids and wonder, are they good enough? And I'm not writing them off by any means, but I think the situation they're in, they ha- they kind of have to be. And I think the makeup of that midfield is the biggest question for me going forward. Because I think defensively, we all have a million things we can yeah. say. And top to bottom, they might have to just redo that entirely. Um, but the midfield for this club, the investment that's in there as well, financially, I'm not 100% certain that that trio that you mentioned is the solution. Yeah, it's it's tough. Um, I did a I did a big deep dive on, on sort of minutes played for uh, Toronto FC this year, uh, and then in in that you just sort of deep keep going, and it's like uh, Jonathan Osorio hasn't played two thousand minutes since twenty eighteen, uh, and when you are spending one million or or potentially more as his contract comes to the end, you're, you're going to want him to play more or have have money available in your salary cap to have somebody who could. Uh, to step in when he's not available and putting more money towards Jonathan who will play 20 games in a season. It's tough. It's tough. Uh, Cause Michael, well, he, he's the guy that leads the team in minutes and only missed 10 minutes all season. You can't expect him turning 36 next year to, to continue to play 3000 minutes, even though he continues to tell us otherwise. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I think, I think you got to go in and like, I think that there was some some big misses this year, and I obviously Marky. There was uh, moving Marky, uh, not bringing in a veteran to replace Nick DeLeon, who had his own issues of his own. But the you really know across the board in this team that there was very minimal depth of players who have a resume of an MLS caliber player, similar to what I said about Montreal. It's like they brought in known quantities in this league, mm-hmm. and Toronto mm-hmm. FC outside of Shane O'Neill didn't do that this year and it really showed and yeah like the the minutes for some of these guys uh were were out, like not outrageous but you're you're getting 1500 minutes from Lucas McNaughton, Kosi Thompson 1600, Lucas Petrasso 1600 like these guys are top 5 top 10 uh in minutes played for for Toronto FC right now and then how can you not expect this team to be out of the playoff picture it's um, the question I have for you, though, on top of all this mm-hmm. is that mm-hmm. in this game, in the last few games, and even let's say the last 10 games, there's been a really big problem up front. And do you think Jesus Jimenez or or Io Akinola is the solution or do they need to go out and, and scrap that project and find a new number nine? Shockingly, Sean, I think they should use that open DP spot on a forward on a nine. I think that's that is the the way to do this and to to not do a Salcedo type mistake where you're you're going to get a DP to play center back, which it doesn't make any sense to me. And unless you can find a surefire midfielder who's in their prime, and which I don't know if they can, I think the track record that's been shown by this club and maybe specifically Bill Manning, is that they can get someone that can play the nine that would be lights out with these front trio. And then you fill in the rest of the squad with MLS caliber players. I think the problem we saw this year is that there weren't enough MLS caliber players on this roster. And I love a lot of what Lucas McNaughton has done. And I think Luca Petrasso getting all those minutes early on was great. And Kosi Thompson probably playing too early in his career, this many minutes, this, these big of minutes because of the injury to Jaquiel Marshall ready like that there's two ways to look at it but I I just see that there wasn't enough MLS quality players to surround the big guys that being said for me the place to invest the big dollars like we've seen it hasn't been proven wrong you get the guys that can score goals in my opinion so I'm a bit I've been quite disappointed from AO Akinola this season as well and I, I know it's early days as well but 
Asus Jimenez starting off the way he did and kind of sputtering out, I can kind of attribute it to a couple of things. I maybe look at the, the departure of pause as a big reason why. For AO, I'm less certain if he can work with these, t- these top two guys. And now it's a question of, do you punt on a guy that will probably be very good soon? Or do you go for someone now that can play with the, t- the front two guys and, and really light it up next season? I think I would lean with the, the, the DP route. Yeah, I, I think you're. I think you're completely right. It's just making sure that you can um, get out of those contracts uh, through through trade mechanisms or your single buyout. Because obviously, Jimenez is nearly a million dollars, and Akinola, I believe, is is in and around uh, the five hundred plus mark. So the yeah the I think what uh, I just we don't have the full answers on is is sort of where the cap flexibility is not knowing how much gam and tam they have and knowing but you just know that they have so many top heavy uh, tam guys that I wondered if they were sort of forced into playing the kids because of those contracts and those situations so having Michael on 1.5 and also on one and uh, and spending uh, a, a nearly a million on uh, uh, Richie Larea like we're, there's so many top heavy players that I wonder if there is cap space to get those those known quantities in the mid, in the midfield. So we'll see. But uh, a lot of time to figure this out because I think that they're they're out of the playoffs. <laughs> yeah. um, so. I was gonna say we could do a we can do a deep dive on on ha- whether having your head coach at, as your soccer director doing the same job is a good thing or a bad thing. I think we've seen pros and cons of both, but that'll be a conversation for another day. I wanted to ask you quickly, who do you think TFC will regret trading more, Sean? Schaffelberg or Preso? Uh, honestly, Schaff is doing quite I, well in Nashville. He needed to get out, I think. He needed to find himself somewhere else. This is the thing, and and like no disrespect to either of the players because I think they're both going to be very good pros. I don't think they're going to regret either. I think that both needed to get a breath of fresh air. They needed to leave home. They need, well, Schaffelberg hasn't been home in a long time, but they needed to get out of their comfort zone and really be pushed. Um, and you just knew that Jacob wasn't fitting into the way that Bob played down the left. And and Preso was just an unknown quantity that could get them Mark Anthony K. So uh, I don't think there's a regret on either side. That's a rational take. Far too rational for <laughs> how sad I felt after Sunday night. But we move forward to another team probably missing the playoffs. Hate to say it, but the Vancouver Whitecaps falling behind early this time. Kate Cowell make an incredible run. A great touch by Jackson Ewell to set up a golazo oh, by Ebo CC. Uh, what a touch that was. Kate Cowell, he's got it, Sean. He's got that it factor. That when you watch oh. him and you see the hair flowing, you're like, this kid is going to be really good. I Yeah, I... I've kept my eye on for a little while now, and I, this is this is probably up the Dave Goss. Um, like I've told you this for a long time, but uh, but gosh, every time he touches the ball, it gets exciting, uh, and he drives with like he drives forward with so much purpose, uh, and and just pushes the ball into the right spot. He's sort of what I think TFC wants Jaden Nelson to be, but isn't. But gosh, what a what a fun uh, prospect to have. Uh, in a in a in a club that might not be doing well right now, but that but once again, Ibo Ise, you got Jackson Ewell who looks really good, Kate Cowell. There's there's something to look forward to in that club, and the Whitecaps maybe not, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. I think I think we could say probably not. I mean, it's funny. I looked at the XG after watching the game, and Vancouver had a higher XG than San Jose, but when they trail, when they trail, it is a slog, and I think it's kind of been. The story this season for the White Castro, I think getting out in front is really important for this team. And the makeup of the squad, maybe maybe that'd be a bit surprising, but I think just the way they're set up, it, it's it's reliant on them playing on the front foot. And even though they had some really positive late chances without Cavalini, they couldn't convert. And we're in a similar situation where they just cannot score goals. It's a really tough one because when when they are in the zone and playing their game and getting the opportunities, they're a fun team to watch, but they are so one dimensional. Uh, and I don't know if that. I know we've we've we chatted with Alex the other week about Sartini being safe, and 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 obviously they've they've done okay this season and they've won a uh, a trophy and and all all of that is is very true, but I think that at some point. 
that question is going to be asked and asked again is that can they create another style of play for when they are chasing games and and being able to create goals by breaking down teams but not not hitting on the quick counter and they need their team to be healthy uh once again that's that comes down to luck sometimes and it comes down to skill of your your training staff but you you look at the goal scores this year it's Lucas Cavallini with eight and Ryan Gall with six. And then the rest are just like threes and twos. It's like, there's nobody else there to lift the team up when they need, they need it. Uh, Brian White's been on and off with injury this year. And I think that that's really hurt this team to have yeah. a third striker. But on the other side, we just said last week that like Lucas Cavallini needed Brian White to be out to really thrive in this spot. So it's like, it's 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 of all side. I don't know. Is this a wait and see? They've obviously brought in a couple really strong midfield pieces uh, yeah. and Gressel into the fold. So is it like, OK, let's wait till midseason next year to see how this team can develop and then make the decision? I think it is. I think it is because I think I think that Canadian championship bought them this time and seeing what Axel Schuster can do in terms of player requirement, I'd be relatively hopeful. If I were them, because I, I like the profile of the players they have brought in. I mean, it obviously has to gel on the field, but yeah. I would, I would, I would say exactly where you're leaning in the sense that we have to go into next season with this full cadre of players in place to really make an assessment on on where this project is going. That being said, Sean, can you guess who has the worst goal differential in MLS? By the ask the question, I'm going to either say Vancouver or San Jose. <laughs> Am I close? <laughs> okay. You are close. It's DC United. It's DC United. Ah. We should have guessed that. Minus, but second, and I'm taking it back by this because it's not TFC. It's Vancouver minus 19. Um, oh my! And I mean, we talked. We talked about the goaltending kind of revolving doors and the injury issues, and I mean, none of it has really helped in that regard. But it. it I think that Canadian championship will be enough to get Vanny and crew yeah. into, into the next season. And, and like Alex was saying last week, maybe restock and reload and get healthy. But I think the playoff dream is over for them too. Let's go to the heat check where it's going to be sad because there's not <laughs> a lot of heat around. So obviously no David this week. So Devang, you're going to deliver the, the Jeez. sad wet Ugh. heat for us today. <laughs> uh, let's start with Toronto FC Devang. Nine wins, 14 losses, uh, seven draws, 34 points. 10th in the East, only four points back, but a couple games yeah. uh, in hand for the rest of the teams, four <laughs> games remaining. Uh, what's the heat for Toronto FC? I hate to say it, but the pilot light is out. The stove is not lighting. There's there's no heat, Sean. There's no heat. I've, I've done the, the calculations and they still can get in, but it would take a, just a hilarious series of events to assure this. I do not think there's any heat left. We've been back and forth all summer, but it feels yeah. fitting on Labor Day or post Labor Day to say the heat is gone, Sean. Moving on. Let's see if there's any heat in this one. Vancouver Whitecaps, nine wins, 13 losses, seven, 34 points, 10th in the West, eight points back, five games remaining. And I think there's a game in hand uh, with the team in seventh. So how are we feeling about Vancouver to Vang? Not worse than TFC, but the same, if that makes sense. I know the point dif yeah. difference is higher, and they have a game on Portland, like you mentioned. Portland is looking decent, but the fire is out. We've all left the party. People are cleaning up bottles, Sean, but the Vancouver Whitecaps bonfire is dead. If there only yeah. was one flame left in Canada, Devang... CF Montreal, where's their heat check? 16 wins, nine losses, four draws, 52 points, a club record, second in the East, 14 up from the playoffs, eight back of first, five games remain. Are we keeping warm? We're keeping red hot. We're keeping red hot. This is a team that I think has incredible aspirations. Maybe they won't catch Philadelphia, but they'll be heading into the playoffs just riding a really nice wave and putting some room between them and, and third and fourth in the east it's red hot it's a positive warming glow too sean it's not one of those heats that that singes you or or sets yourself on fire this is a nice glow warming heat as the the nights get cooler and the days get shorter tuck in with montreal hopefully it's gonna run long that's the that's the hope keep with us montreal we need you <laughs> moving on to some mls Seriously. headlines <laughs> Not sure if you watched the LA Galaxy game, but Chicharito oh, had God. the ability to win the game yeah. for LA this past weekend in the 90th minute and blew the Panenka. 
So the question I have for you, though, is uh, do you think there's any difference in like hitting the bar or missing the net and missing a panenka? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The level oh, yeah? of shame involved is just extremely <laughs> high. And I, I think the other the other thing is that Fool's Camp was panenka in that U.S. Open Cup <laughs> yeah. shootout, wasn't he? So this guy literally was probably the one thing he was looking for was the panenka. He knew it was coming. And I think pre-scouting is a thing that might have been done. I'm not sure. But if I was in his ear or one of his teammates, I think that information would have been key. Totally fair. I just, I think that the Panenka is used so much these days that it's not something yeah. that, um, that it, you, it's not like you're the one person who tried the Panenka and, and, and failed miserably. It's one of those where it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tactic that's used. And so, so is shooting it to the bottom right corner and not getting it perfect. Like I understand how like you're just sitting there and just being like, oh damn it. I really messed up. But at the same time, I don't know. And also Chicharito did have a penalty in the 80th minute, so he's got to change it up and got to try new. I, yeah, new. That is true. So it's 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 tough. But yes, you look, you got egg on your face. But I also, I don't blame the Panenka tanker any different than as somebody missing the post or getting saved. That's my take. But do you do you factor in that this possibly will keep them out of the playoffs in that analysis? <sighs> Because I think that's a big deal. Yeah, it it, it <laughs> is, but deal. but putting the ball to the right or putting the ball to the left, yeah, like is this? It's putting it down the pipe. It's doing it in a different speed. Yes, you're clowning the guy, but it's also I don't know. I I'm very zen about it. But if it happened in a Spurs game, I might have a different conversation. So. For sure, for sure. Moving on. Obviously, uh, Henny Mukhtar has been on fire as of late. He's got eight goals, three assists in the last five games. He's won player of the week the past two weeks. He's now sitting with 21 goals and 11 assists. Leads goal scoring in Major League Soccer. And Nashville's comfortably sitting in the playoffs. Is Drew C out of here? Is he the new MVP of this season? Is Mokhtar the man? Honestly, it should be... We should boil down the voting to head-to-head results. And if this last game counts as the, the <laughs> ma- major deciding factor, then it is Hani Mukhtar's. I loved his quotes too, though, because I, I he obviously spent some time with Jerisi in the All-Star game. And, and he's talking about how he's a good dude and he's very humble, but he wants to win this award badly. And I think he knows he deserves it. I think Nashville knows he deserves it based on maybe the style they play, which is basically pass it to Hani and hope to hell that he can generate something. And he often does. Um I find it hard to to disregard Drew Reese, though, just because of how good Austin has been. And I mean, statement games are statement games, and this is one for Nashville, but Austin has had a few themselves. So it'll go down to the wire. If I had to vote today, though, Sean, I want to give it to Hani Mukhtar because I feel like this this guy deserves it on the gross of what he has done at Nashville. Yeah. Here's just a, a, a side question to this. After a season like this, and obviously I'm not talking about Qatar, is there any way that Mukhtar could get a call from the German national team. Is there anything he can do in Major League Soccer that would get him a call? Once again, in a friendly or something, just a look. He's mm-hmm. 27. He's not out of the picture. Uh, yes, because I feel like Germany would not, they would pride themselves on not disregarding people from non-Bundesliga clubs or non-big clubs, but mm-hmm. boy, he would have to win MVP and like, I don't know. There'd have to be an injury crisis as well with Germany. Fair enough. Fair enough. Moving on, uh, LAFC newcomer Dennis Buanga was quoted saying, "I joined the PSG of Major League Soccer." Uh, so my is that question good, is, by the way, was that a positive thing Dennis was saying, or is that <laughs> a lament? I I think it's the the front positive, three, yeah. the star power, the. <laughs> The uh, we're gonna win everything except for the big trophy. Uh, <laughs> so uh, LA is not gonna win uh, Concacaf Champions League. But uh, if this is true, Devang, I want to ask you: Who's the Arsenal of Major League Soccer? Cool, God. <laughs> oh, so this is a good question. My easy answer would be Colorado Rapids because they're owned by uh, yeah. KSC, but. I wonder if if Sporting Kansas City is fair. Okay. A team who has yeah, quite a bit of history in this league and I think they are they're they're known I I would say they're known as one of the flagship franchises of the league, but that's sort of on the past. 
and I mm-hmm. wonder if Peter Vermees is reaching Arsene Wenger territory. So okay. I I feel like SKC might be an Arsenal comp. I'm curious what you think. No, I going deep into it, I think you're right. Like I I thought that maybe DC United or LA Galaxy could also be in there. Uh, but I think not to be disrespectful, and, and I'm not meaning to make a side call. I think the LA Galaxy are a bit too Hollywood to be yeah, Arsenal. Yeah. Like uh, but I th- I think that they they have like, they had that like four year five year period where they were like just pumping everyone L A so they sort of and then they've been sort of struggling they're trying to find their new way they've got this guy that they believe in and they're starting off real hot but I don't know it's uh, there's but I, I love your SKC one because the Vermes being in Wenger territory is very true right now and I, I love love that one. Um, last I don't but not least, it, John. it pains me. You don't it pains me, but it's true. It's true. <laughs> last but not least, uh, speaking of, we talked about Mukhtar and and Germany, but Atlanta United midfielder Tiago Almeida made the preliminary hey. roster for Argentina for upcoming uh, friendlies. So while he's impressed in Atlanta, uh, we shouldn't expect him to get on a plane to Qatar, right? Who? Probably not. I do feel like Argentina. Let me say this. I think the chances of him getting called are better than Hani Mukhtar. I don't know how much that is saying, but I, I do yeah, think yeah, yeah. there's an avenue I could see. Um, Atlanta, boy, oh boy, what a disaster. But <laughs> I don't think you could say that Tiago Almeida signing was a disaster. You know what I mean? No, I think this no, year no. obviously has gone terribly for them, but a 21 who, who I think will be part of the solution there. Um, I don't think it's impossible. I would be pretty surprised though if he if he got the call of World Cup. Yeah, I think I understand why they would do some like a call like that. Somebody you know, sort of like using one of those last ones to sort of groom the next generation and sort of push things through. Mm-hmm. I just don't know if Tiago Almeida is the guy to be that that guy to take the spot. And so I think they're just getting a taste and seeing where they're going and just getting him involved. Um, it's going to be exciting though to get in, into the call with uh, with with Messi awesome. and, and uh, the whole yeah. gang. So uh, it's, it's fun. It's, it's good to see. And hopefully you can impress. Their kits look pretty fire as well. World cup's coming, Sean. We're getting very oh. close. My, oh my, I can't wait. It's going to be a blast. All right. Coming up after the break, we head to Canadian premier league land to talk to Mitchell Tierney, friend of the show, everything going on in the CPL, including the rise of Valor of C and some teams who thought they were comfortable being on the hot seat in terms of the playoff chase, we talked about all that coming up next on AFE. Welcome back to AFP. Very pleased to welcome back friend of the show, Mitchell Tierney, to the pod to talk everything Canadian Premier League. Mitch, how are you doing, man? Doing well, thanks. Yeah, awesome and exciting time of the season. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to talking all things CPL. We'll uh, we'll get to how we last time you were on we buried the non playoff team saying there was no way in hell they'd get in but so shockingly the playoff picture has turned we'll get to that but first Mitch the big news out of CPL land the past couple of weeks a new commissioner is in town Mark Noonan obviously early days for him on the gig but CanPL.ca had a chance to sit down with him to talk about things what were your first impressions of him Yeah I think uh, in a lot of ways he fits multiple facets of what the league really needs from a commissioner. I mean, he first and foremost has experience of not only working, you know, within a soccer league, but a soccer league within North America, understanding, you know, some of the the complications that come with that, be it travel or, you know, just the sporting landscape and, you know, how many different sports there really are here and the, and where soccer is within those sports. Um, so that's important. He has a very similar um, you know, understanding of the marketing side of things with his time with Soccer United Marketing. And then he's even, you know, run a club uh, club himself out in Ghana. So he has the understanding of what it's like to run an individual club. So I think my first impression is just mostly that it seems like a great hire from the experience standpoint. And, and you know, the fact that he does have so much on his resume that really fits exactly what the Canadian Premier League is trying to do going forward. In even in the first week or so, uh, in the opening press conference, uh, the commissioners already talked about expansion, finding the right markets, and what success looks like in those markets. Um, do you expect 
him to to look at a lot of different markets, unconventional markets, or do you do you feel like the next step for him in regards to expansion is is more of the um, the the traditional markets of uh, a Montreal, uh, a Saskatchewan? Uh, where do you think his sights are set? Well, I think first and foremost, he's got a few that you know certainly uh, is first and you know first on the the docket in terms of the the Vancouver side and and building towards that and obviously there's the you know the the prairies as well um they they're in that and Windsor there's a couple of places where you know they are working on getting those done but yeah I do think that there's a lot of opportunity here certainly and we've we've found that in the Canadian Premier League that there's some you know markets that maybe you wouldn't have thought of as soccer markets that have um really thrived so far so i think there's a there's plenty of work to be done and obviously one thing he talked about and you know you learn that certainly in the early years of mls is doing it right finding the right sides and um you know being willing to yeah just make some tough decisions in terms of long term um where they should go and and what's next um for for the league there's a couple of expansion clubs on the horizon uh, which we mentioned saskatoon vancouver windsor slash essex county but Looking inwards towards the clubs that currently exist right now, Mitch, I know it's early days for the new commish, but you look at some of, not the haves and have-nots, but some teams who have found really solid footing and some teams still looking to find their place, whether it's in the market or in the league itself. Has has he mentioned FC Edmonton and what he wants to see happen there, or is it still early days in that process? Uh, still early days in that process. I mean, you know, um, obviously... Everyone knows the the situation out in Edmonton right now, and you know honestly, I think by and large, it's it's been impressive this season what the team on the pitch has been able to do, um, all things considered. And you know, if you ask Alan Koch, he's got the most difficult job in football. He'll tell you that every time uh, you interview him. <laughs> but uh, within that job, I think Edmonton's done quite well and provided a place for a lot of very solid young players to to get some opportunities here. And I think players that we're going to see in this league and maybe in other leagues, you know down the road very soon so I, I think uh yeah i think that there's still work to be done there but certainly you know i think it's it's too early to say anything uh on edmonton um we'd sort of devang has hit it at it off the top but uh we sort of wrote off any other team making the playoffs other than the quote-unquote big four but over the past nine ten days valor fc made us eat our words pretty big uh with some big wins over pacific and twice uh, against forge what are you seeing from valor right now that uh we may have not seen at the early part of the season i think it's just that intensity right like i think they realized that their backs were against the wall and um they they found that out earlier than some of these sides who did have that gap and could maybe maybe did get a little bit complacent in terms of, you know, the fact that it really did seem like a four horse race for almost the entire season. And then all of a sudden uh, Valor's in there and, and they've been playing like these are cup finals for the past, you know, month for sure. And they've been honestly working harder and outworking some of the top teams over the past little bit. And then that gets them into a playoff spot. And I think it's, um, they've found a system and we, we've honestly seen with some of these top sides, maybe your forge and, and Calvary and Pacific to a lesser extent, like, They've done a little bit of experimenting. They've they've kind of switched up their systems a little bit as as you know they had that margin for error and Valor's really found an identity and just stuck to it and just worked on that and you know they're really at this point incredibly difficult to beat within that. So we mentioned Valor's power surge and the fact that they've made us eat our words, but I think the reason we were so confident, or at least I was confident, that the top four would would remain in place is because I I didn't see the struggles uh, coming for Forge that they've suffered through. And I'm, I'm looking at them. I'm looking at Pacific. I'm looking at Calvary. Hell, o- Atletico Ottawa is within reach as well. But let's say Valor does continue this, Mitch. Who do you think drops out? Because I think it would be a stunning thing to say a few weeks ago that Forge might not like the playoffs. But it's a possibility. It is a possibility. I think it's it's a toss up between uh, Forge and Pacific. And I think for slightly different reasons. Obviously, Pacific had the CONCACAF League run and i think that you know maybe they weren't quite as deep as some of these other top sides in the canadian Premier league and they maybe found that out a little bit during that run um where you know some of the other sides maybe would have had more options that they could have thrown in and you know made that work but for forge i think it's almost the opposite problem where they just have so many good players and so many options especially in attack that 
they haven't really found a consistent lineup yet and they keep throwing out different combinations each game as the you know they struggle to score goals and you wonder if there's almost a, a lack of chemistry there between those attacking players just because they look so different every match and I know Bobby Smirniotis prides himself on having a side that is tactically flexible and, and can play in a bunch of different ways but there's just really no rhythm to this Forge team right now so those are two things that I think uh, I, I think are going to come up big as, as the final part of the season happens yeah. and these you know there's there's a lot of challenges but the one thing with valor as well as they do have four matches away from home in their final five so i think that is worth talking about in terms of you know how how difficult it still is going to be for them but they're above the line right now and you know that's the hardest <laughs> the hardest spot to get to so they're you know um at the moment they're looking good I was going to say, I, the fact that Pacific was hosting York United and I'm, I'm thinking they'll get back on track and then they lose 3-1. So perhaps <laughs> the early schedule look ahead is not as, as secure as we thought because I was thinking the Fair. same thing, looking at how far some of these teams have to travel. And, and you mentioned what Pacific has had to done. Just keeping with the Forge, uh, with Forge, as you'd sort of mentioned, uh, I just have a question from Ask AFP that I, I think fits perfectly right now. And he asks... Uh, with Forge having so much attacking power, uh, do you see anyone leaving in the off season? And do you think Jordan Hamilton and Taron Campbell can coexist in the lineup? I think they can coexist in the lineup. Um, I don't think it's the best for either of them too, because I do do think they're both at their best when they're playing that central number nine position. And we've seen Campbell play as a little bit more of a winger this year and and in past years as well. And I just don't think it's where he's at his best. So. Um, I, you know, I don't think it's, it's impossible to have both of them on the pitch together, but I think right now I wouldn't necessarily do it. And I do think the player that probably is most likely to leave still, and I, and I, you almost wondered when they brought in Hamilton, if this was like a contingency plan against that is Wuben Spasius, <laughs> just because of the age, the amount of goals he scored, um, all of that, you know, he's, he's that player that fits the, the profile of the sort of players we've seen move out of the Canadian Premier League in, in recent, uh, weeks and months. So that would be the guy, but again, he's got to be more consistent. Um, he's been either amazing this season or, you know, he's gone these long stretches without goal scoring. I think it's five now that he hasn't scored in. So um, if you're a young player like that, like that's one of the key things is being able to to consistently score. And, um, you know, Pasillas scores in bunches, but he doesn't always score. And that's that, that's what he's got to work on. But I do think that overall, if, if a guy is moving out, I think it would be Pasillas. And for good reason, I think, you know, he has that ability to move to the next level. We've talked about this subject a few times on this show, including with you, Mitch, the under 21 minutes, which I think is a fascinating storyline and not to pump the CPL's tires, but something I love because we're now looking at a situation where Atletico Ottawa, who is in first and look quite good and, and have built on their foundation of being really tough to play against defensively and being secure enough to play on the road. That's great. But what's not great, depending on how you look at it, is the fact that they still need 500 plus minutes from their under, under 21 players to reach that 2000 minute threshold. Five matches left. It's a bit of a gamble. It's a bit of a dice throw, Mitch. I'm wondering what, how you look at this, because I think you could argue that it's paid off so far that they find themselves in the situation. With that said, though, it's not like they're completely secure to get in the playoffs. No, but I, I think they'll be fine. I mean, they brought in Owen Antonia on loan from, from the Vancouver Whitecaps and have started, you know, getting him significant minutes, including this past weekend. So um, I think they can do it minutes wise. They've also made a number of young signings um, in terms of developmental contracts where, you know, if things, <laughs> if push comes to shove, <laughs> yeah, they can, they can put some of those guys on, but I think they have enough of a, you know, enough of a gap right now where, where they'll be fine and they can, they can play some of these young players. I was actually a bit more surprised that they didn't roll out more of these young guys, maybe against an FC Edmonton, but the way Edmonton performed, you can, you can see why, like they, right. you know, if they, right. if they played a second rate lineup, Edmonton might've actually won that match. So um, yeah, I think that there's, there's definitely work to be done. And, you know, we saw Antonio fall down like maybe four times in that Edmonton match and you wanted a shot up at the uh, FC or at the uh, Atlantic <laughs> Ottawa manager's box just to see what they were looking like up there because it probably uh probably wasn't the happiest of times but yeah i think i think they'll be fine in the long term i think they've made the the proper moves obviously they're cutting it close but i think they'll be good and then on the other side you have york united who have now logged over 5500 minutes of under 21 uh, minutes played well obviously in the standings it hasn't really uh shown success 
But do you figure maybe in 2023 or 2024 that you'll really see this York United core prove to be winners down the long run? Well, I think we saw it this weekend a little bit in terms of the the <laughs> real ability that they're starting to to have. And the second part of the season, as we've seen some of these signings come in, I mean, Moba Bull, he's been a game changer for them. He yeah. just gives them so much more going forward and so many different um, little nuances in the midfield that they can do now. But yeah, I think I think we're starting to see really now that they're healthy, now that they have more options that yes, this is a side that has plenty, plenty of potential and some of these players are getting better and with, you know, better shape around them and and a couple more veterans brought in. I think that this is going to be a side that we definitely watch for next year in the Canadian Premier League and even, you know, they're they're basically out of it this year, but they're not as mathematically out of it. So I think they could still do some damage down the stretch. And I think that they fully plan on doing some damage down the stretch because they know now that they're good enough to beat pretty much anyone in this league. Seeing Mo as the 10 on that side has been a treat because I think if you had to argue the one thing uh, amongst a couple of things that they were missing dearly was that creator. And he's been really well, unlocking yeah. a lot of fun stuff. Um, heading out east, Mitch. The Wanders, Halifax, they paid Calvary to a nil-nil draw. It looks like, barring the the unexpected slash impossible, they will miss the playoffs this year. But I think it's an interesting case study of this club because outside of the pitch, I think they are considered one of the model franchises and one of the vanguards of the league, sending up one of the tent poles out east. But on the pitch, obviously, outside of the island game, success has been harder to come by. This is a weird question, but like, how important is it that the team is actually good on the field in this situation, Mitch? Because I think the support they garner, and and you saw it in the Canadian Championship match, and like, this is a special, uh, it's a special place to go watch a game, etc. But is the on-field product lacking a concern for you? Well, I think uh, a certain club that we've watched for many years, Toronto FC, will tell you that at some point, <laughs> eventually, big time, you do big time. you do kind of have to start getting wins on the field, or people will start to to head away, and especially you know in a in a market like Halifax, where maybe it's not the most traditional soccer market. Although again, they've been absolutely fantastic since they've come into the league, and and like you said, set the standard for the fan you know, atmosphere that they've had there and that they've created organically among the fan groups. But I, yeah, I think that they do need success on the field. And I think that they're, you know, I mean, first and foremost, it, Joao Morelli would have helped a lot this year. That that goes without saying like one player like that in the Canadian Premier League where, um, you know, it's still a, still a fledgling league. A player like that going down is, is so tough. I mean, we almost see that with Pacific and many Aparicio in terms of just how different they look, with that one player out in terms of when he's in the lineup. So I think that's still a a factor. And I mean, this is a side that still, uh, you know, in this, in what this four seasons in still struggles to win away from home. Um, Halifax is a great place to come play. They have, for most of the season have had decent results there, although they've struggled a little bit at times and, but just going away from home. I mean, it's, it's tough traveling into Halifax It's tough traveling away from Halifax. They need to work on that. And then, um, just consistency. I mean, they, they still haven't won back-to-back games all season, which, uh, you know, for, for any side trying to make the playoffs, that's never going to, that's never going to happen. So, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work to be done. I think there's, there's definitely some good players in Halifax. Fumpa Mwanwe is an exciting player that they've just brought in. Uh, Sam Salters had some bright moments this season. Zach Fernandez is, is for me, one of the premier fullbacks in the Canadian Premier League. But yeah, I, I think that sooner rather than later, they've got to figure out stuff on the pitch. Just to keep on uh, on Sam Salter just for a little bit, um, with such size uh, and and scoring prowess this season, um, he sort of seems like one of those sort of uh, next step uh, players to sort of circle. Uh, consistency hasn't been uh, uh, on his side this year, but uh, what do you think Salter needs to do to take take his game to the next step and sort of be that that consistent let's call it 10 goal scorer in this league or to maybe make to make the next step to major league soccer well Stephen hart answered that question for me after the game <laughs> he, was, uh, he was pretty frustrated with uh, salter's play against calvary because salter did have a number of very good chances and wasn't able to finish them so i think it's basically that i mean five of his 
I think it's 10 goals this season have come from the penalty spot. So, um, I mean, that is a, that is a credit to a young player. You know, it's, it's not easy to step up in those pressure situations and, and score penalties. So, um, I think that that is actually a plus for Salter, but at the same time, you know, from open play, we've seen a lot this year where he gets into very, very good positions, but just can't finish it off. So I think that, um, you know, even even above the consistency aspect is just finishing his chances a little bit better. That will be the difference between Salter being a, you know, solid Canadian Premier League player as he is currently and potentially one of those players that can make the move to the next level. Final question, Mitchell, and it's time to put you on the hot seat. A couple <laughs> months left or I guess a couple weeks left, to be honest, but it's award season soon enough. We're looking for your picks. Let's start with player of the year. Player of the year. Well, I go back and forth on this a lot, but I think with what Atletico Ottawa has done this year and and what this player has been able to do, both in terms of setting up goals, in terms of scoring them himself, Ollie Bassett. Um, I think he's just so Ooh. central to what they do there on both attacking and defending, and I think he'd be my my player of the year. The finest head of hair in the league as well, if you enjoy <laughs> it standing out on the broadcast. Uh, love that pick. Let's go next to Golden Glove. Golden Glove. Uh, again, this is one that I've I've gone back and forth on. I think Callum Irving, though, out in Pacific. Um, he's mm-hmm. been fantastic this year. He's made some some huge saves for them. Um, so I think that, you know, I think that the fact that they're still in the playoff race in, in a lot of ways has to do with some great saves from Callum Irving. So that would be my pick. Leads the league in saves made. And I was desperately hoping he, he was able to save one of those penalties in the CONCACAF league because he deserved it. But that's the way sport goes sometimes. Coach of the year. I think we're going back to Ottawa, if I'm going to guess. Yeah, we are. I think Carlos Gonzalez coming in and, and you know, <laughs> it's worse the first right now. Like it's very much on and that is incredibly impressive for him to do. So I think that that is a, a reasonably easy choice. Although um, there's certain people out in uh, out in Hamilton who will be frustrated that Bobby Smirniotis still hasn't won the, the Legacy <laughs> Award. But uh, yeah, I do think that it has to be Carlos this year. This is like when LeBron could win MVP every year, but he doesn't. So it's like, is this right? Is this normal? How is he not coaching exactly, the year? Yeah. Uh, it's so difficult. <laughs> last, last one, and probably one that's maybe the most intriguing, under-21 player of the year. Mm-hmm. This one's, yeah, like you said, there's so many good players. Honestly, a lot of the player of the year candidates are also under-21. Exactly. One of the <laughs> exactly. great parts of this league. Um, one of the things I mentioned was consistency, and I think that that is so important, especially for a young player, but for any player in this league. So, um, you know, I've mentioned Pasias, um, also, you know, a guy like Salter could be in there, but the guy who's been consistent is Ozaze de Rosario. And, yes. you know, you look at what he's been able to do for a York team that really has struggled to score goals in large stretches this season. He's consistently been a player who's scored goals. Um, that honestly is probably my pick at this point is Ozazi de Rosario. The people's pick too. I'm guessing that's Sean's pick. I'm not even going to oh, let you is, answer, yeah. Sean. It's just based <laughs> on the, the guttural side. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, Mr. Tierney, always a pleasure. Follow him at Michel Tierney on Twitter.com and follow his stuff at CPL Soccer on Twitter plus canpl.ca. Mitchell, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me on, guys. All right, after the break, Sean and I wrap up this week's show with the mailbag, Ask AFP. And welcome back. It's now time for Ask AFP, where Devang and myself will do our best to answer all your questions. Uh, thanks for everyone who sent their questions on the Patreon Discord, as well as Twitter. Uh, we're going to start first with a bit of Canadian content and then move into some MLS content. Uh, first, we'll start with Tim B, who asks, with nine more games before the World Cup, how many goals do you think Jonathan David will have for Lille? He currently sits at four goals in six games. Devang? I think he'll get to 10. I think it might be conditioning on condition on the fact that he needs to run into some more outfits like a Montpellier side who half the team was hurt or suspended and then they played like garbage on the field too. That might help. <laughs> that might help JD get to 10 goals. But I love I love what I see from him in terms of the, the types of goals he scored as well. I think they're I don't know how to uh, hungry goals. That's a pretty poor yeah. descriptor, but I feel like no, they're but... they're goals that we saw JD score when he was at the peak of his powers um, not too long ago, and I think that's a great sign. So I think ten wouldn't be unreasonable. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking you're right. Um, I I think 
I think I'm on the lower side. I think eight or nine is probably where I'm going to see it at. Um, just because I think this year, at least from what I've seen with watching a couple of Lille games, and I know that he's always been a connector in that in that team. He drops back, he, he connects, but I feel like they're asking a little bit more of him this year to be uh, a bit more creator, a bit more farther back, so he's not goal poaching as much. So we might see his assist number uh, go up just a, just a little bit. But I do think that in this system, in this league, when they're not playing against uh, PSG, I, I think that he is going to be one of the uh, best players in the league, and I think he's going to come into to Qatar firing on all cylinders. So I think it's exciting to see uh, from a Canadian aspect. Um, moving on, uh, speaking with another Canadian, uh, Forever Ed asks, uh, Theo Corbinu, um, who scored three goals in the last uh, three matches that he's played. Uh, what's the ceiling for a player like him? Uh, do we see him as a Premier League player? Do we see him as maybe playing in the Champions League one day? What do you think, Devang? Extremely hopeful about Theo. I mean, I think the the route he has taken and and where he's at in loan in the championship is the ultimate uh, testing ground for a 20-year-old. And the way he started for a Blackpool side that I think is relying on on players like him, if that makes sense. Like he's not a, a bit player or a fridge player. He's getting opportunities and he's shown that he's capable so far. I mean, there's two ways to look at it. He could be a Champions League player for Bruges, right, Sean? Or like another yeah, yeah. Um, big team in a small country. Or he could be a player who's getting regular game time for a West Ham or a, an Aston Villa. And I think that's his level. I think he can be a Premier League regular, which... I mean, it's massive, and I guess it, it depends on how you want to weight it, but that could be more important than a Champions League player. Yeah, I think the thing that makes him special is his his size and power and speed and all of that coming together um, is going to make him uh, a commodity in the Premier League and is probably why uh, a team like Wolves still has him on the roster and still wants to see more from him and, and, and really wants to see him grow. But yeah, because I think... I think that there, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for him as as long as he continues to grow. Obviously, uh, last year his uh, his time at Wednesday didn't go too well. A lot of managers are unsure of where to play him. It's sort of that like, are you a fullback? Are you a uh, a front three? Um, but I think that what they're learning is that he can play both. But I think that he's he's better in the front three uh, and can create his own. He can use his size to his advantage. Uh, so as long as once again, he continues on this step and shows that he can play uh, at a high level. I, in, in, in this current, like the next, whatever, 10 games, 20 games at Blackpool. I think that we can really see that, uh, that yeah, uh, a West Ham, a, uh, a Villa or a Newcastle could, could have him up, up top. Uh, and and have him as a big part of their team. Moving on, we've got one from uh, Dan H. Um, yesterday, uh, Paulo Nagamura was let go of his job at Houston. So with the firing of Nagamura, what's the vibe check on longtime MLS assistants who finally got their shot this year? So Pineda in Atlanta, Hendrickson at Chicago, uh, Noonan in Cincinnati, and lastly, obviously, Nagamura in uh, in Houston. The Vang vibe check? Uh, well... Results wise, not great, to be honest. I think all of those clubs are not in the playoff spot at this moment. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sean. But I, I think I if you look at Nagamura's, is Cincy an eighth though now? I think they're an eighth. Yeah, I think new, but they have a game in hand. In any case, we'll put them in for now. But <laughs> with that said, especially looking at the Nagamura case, like I'm not going to say he was set up to fail, but the, 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 <laughs> They changed half their team. They added 10 new players. 12 of them left. They added Hector Herrera, which I think, I guess, increases the temperature on what is expected. But I felt like he was he was hired to be fired in this situation. And not to say he was a fall guy, but I wonder if that was communicated to him as well, that the leash was going to be short. Because I, I think it's quite, a, it's quite a way to go when the team is in such upheaval. And this is the definition of a transition year. I, for me, I, I think hiring within the league remains preferable, Sean. So I, I don't think this is an indictment on the assistant um, getting the, the full-time gig because I think we've seen examples of like a Robin Frazier who I think had done both but had went back to being assistant and deserved another shot. I'd like that there's an opportunity in this league for those guys. So I, I think it's unfair probably to to zoom in too hard on these specific examples. I mean, Pineda in Atlanta, I, I 
the whole organization seems to be in in trouble, right? And I think we've talked about Chicago at length, trying to redo everything. And I like what Noonan is doing in Cincinnati. So I don't think it's a one, one card ch- checks all. Yeah, I think the thing that we're noticing and is that they're sort of using these these first time coaches or these long time assistants as as like almost a stopgap into while they find who they really want. And that's not fair for them. It gives them the opportunity to show everyone wrong, but it's it's not creating a, a great opportunity for all of these guys to know that they have a short leash and that there's only a year or so to, to figure these out in, in clubs that are already like the rosters are brutal and you're working through things. The onus needs to be back on the full on front office for making these decisions and less on the manager. Uh, and, and that, that sadly continues to be, I think, I don't know. I don't know if this is a larger sports issue or if it's a MLS issue, but I just feel like the, the manager has become a fall person way too much and like the leash for a bad manager is is getting slower and slower and it's and you don't even know if they're a bad manager like i do i know what root wayne rooney is like in a locker room it made in major league soccer no but by looking at what has happened in the last six or seven games you're like oh he's got to be terrible but you gotta give them the opportunity to grow it's like in any other sort of job obviously results matter but you, you got to set them up to to succeed. And if you're not doing that, then you look on yourself. The difference is Wayne's going to get that time, right? Because he's Wayne Rooney. Yeah, and yeah, of course. I, I don't think these guys will, right? And that's that goes to exactly what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one, one question that actually just came into the Discord, and I want to add this one in because it, it's, it's from S. McGinnis, and he always brings the fire, but this is a good one. Uh, he wants to know what our thoughts were for the lack of a Greg Vanny tribute when the Galaxy came to town this this past week. Uh, we had sort of talked about it and sort of jokingly said, "Oh, I don't know. They maybe they won't do it because you know what." But what do you think, Devang? What's your thoughts on that? Absolutely stunned and quite mad about it. To be honest, I'm glad S. McGinnis asked this because we nearly time had almost healed this wound, Sean. I almost forgot of how mad I was <laughs> that night. I'm a bit stunned, to be honest. I don't get it. I understand if there's some hard feelings perhaps about Greg choosing the galaxy or perhaps Greg didn't want the tribute. I mean, there is some suggestion that maybe they asked him and he didn't want to do anything. But I, I think to not address this at all in front of a packed house for a big game like that with Victor Vasquez also there, I really didn't understand it. And I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still kind of stunned, to be honest. Completely. I'm with you. And um, we obviously don't know how it all ended with Bill and Greg. But what needs to continue to be reminded is that it's n- neither of their clubs. It's it's MLSE's club and sure. But like the club is bigger than people. And at the end of the day, Greg Vanny brought the championship to the club and he just wanted to go home. And so no matter how it all sort of fell out, You've got to respect that and you've got to thank him for this moment. And this is an opportunity to give them thanks. And once again, it doesn't matter about Bill Manning's relationship or Bob Bradley's relationship with Greg Vanny. It's bigger than that. It's it's the club. And and Exactly. And and yeah, he he needs to be respected for doing a thing that nobody else has ever done for the club. And yeah, it's it's a travesty. Um I guarantee guarantee that that conversation was had it wasn't an oversight yeah uh knowing knowing who's in the front office and knowing who's uh managing game operations you know that that conversation was going to that happened and the decision was made and that is just it's it's sad it's a sad statement of of where where sort of minds are at the club right now Credit to you, Espigitis. You've got me extremely mad all over again. <laughs> oh, man. Going to stew into the night. How could you not? How could you not do that? What? Uh, last but not least, we've got a longtime fan. We got one from David oh. Goss. Guys, <laughs> U.S. Open Cup is on Wednesday night. You got to talk about it. Who do you got winning? Orlando or Sacramento? <sighs> so... I'm torn here, Sean, because we got to back, back our boy, Tesho Akindele. 
Canadian yeah. forward who plays for Orlando and who's been quite good for this team in this tournament as well. But don't we have to back Todd Dunavant, uh, TFC Completely. legend, who is the president and GM of Sacramento Republic, and also the Sacramento story in general is one we love in cup competition. So it's got to be Sacktown all day. Yeah, I believe Danny Dicchio is an assistant there as well. That's right. So, Jeez. so we got Deitch in there as well. It's, yeah, I think this is going to be the cheesiest answer I'm ever going to give. And I apologize ahead of time. You know who's going to be winning on Wednesday night? The fans. The game? The fans the are going to be okay. winning. I thought you were going to say the sport. I, okay, that's slightly <laughs> less cheesy than the sport, but wow. But wow. but yeah, like you got yourself, Orlando, a team that hasn't really won anything in, in its Major League Soccer existence. And you got Sacramento trying to do something that the only the Rochester Raging Rhinos has ever done. It's uh, History is going to be made on the night. I think it's going to be a really fun time for anyone who's tuning in. Uh, and yeah, obviously, I think everyone other than Orlando fans are going to cheer for Sacramento. I think it's a fun story, and I think it's the little guys. But I, I think at the end of the day, Orlando, Orlando trounced Red Bull. To get here, and I think right. they, I think they know what's in front of them, and I think that they're, they got their eye on the prize, and I think they're going to win. If Malik Foster takes a penalty again and Panakis again, <laughs> they deserve not only the U.S. Open Cup, but they deserve the MLS Cup as well. Just give them that trophy as well. Uh, can't wait for that game, eight Eastern Wednesday night. Find it where you can. Shouts to DG. Shouts to his lovely new wife Megan. Congrats to them. Uh, David will be back next week. Sean, great show, sir. I think that's all we have for today. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. If you did enjoy it, please rate or review it wherever you get your podcasts. Plus, hit us up on Twitter at a football pod, as well as on patreon.com forward slash a football podcast. Join us there, get the show ad free, get it early on Tuesdays. Plus, join the Discord. We're chatting about Sean's trading cards and everything else all the time. <laughs> Lastly, thank you to Mitchell Tierney for joining us as always and for producer Greg on the ones and twos. And for Sean, thank you so much for listening to AFP. We'll talk to you next week.